Dodgers people seem to believe that he's going to get better. And if he's mediocre at the start, a fringe average in the scouting parlance, maybe he's average two months in, and maybe by the end of the season, he's above average. Seriously, this guy is one of the best athletes in the game. Would you put anything past him? I don't think we should. Welcome everyone to Fair Territory, and believe it or not, to start the show this week, I've got some breaking news. It's not maybe the breaking news you guys all want. Blake Snell, Jordan Montgomery, J.D. Martinez, on and on and on. It's breaking news concerning this show. We're going to be back live on Thursday at 12.30 Eastern. That's right. We're going to have a second show this year. Monday is going to be the first show. Thursday is going to be the second show. And not only are we going to have two shows a week, I'm going to be joined on Thursday by a co-host who will help me answer your questions. Now, I'm not going to reveal the identity of this co-host just yet, tell you who him or her might be. I'm holding that for myself. But it's going to be a nice surprise for you guys Thursday when you tune into the show. It's someone I've worked before, someone who is at the top of his or her field, someone that a lot of baseball fans have a great deal of fondness for. So two shows a week this year. We're going to run through your questions on Thursday. We're going to save Dude and Dork of the week for Thursday. It's a little better fit at the end of the week. And I'm really excited that we're going to be doing this twice a week all through 2024. Now, for the regular portion of the program, let's begin. It's March 18th. Spring training is coming to a close. The regular season, at least for the Dodgers and Padres, starts on Wednesday in Seoul, South Korea. The domestic regular season starts a week from Thursday. Now, when I was growing up in New York, when I was a little bitty child, on the 10 o'clock news on Channel 5, it was before Channel 5 was a Fox affiliate, it was before Fox even existed, there used to be an announcement at the start of the 10 o'clock news. And the announcement would be, it's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? Well, I will say that it is March 18th. Do you know where your free agents are signing? And yes, I'm talking about Blake Snell and Jordan Montgomery and J.D. Martinez and Michael Lorenzen and Mike Clevenger and Tommy Pham and Brandon Belt, among others. They're still out there. Now, Snell is the hot topic of the moment. He's been really the hot topic all off season. On Friday, The Athletic reported, myself and Chandler Rome, that the Astros were seriously engaged in a pursuit of Snell. To this point, that has not gone anywhere. Why? Why do you think? Shocking news here, folks. There's a difference in valuation between how the Astros see Blake Snell and how Scott Boris, his agent, sees Blake Snell. But yet, you still have the Astros in the mix. Jose Urquidy, we're going to find out more about his injury on Monday. You've got the Yankees. Garrett Cole out probably two months. Now, I know they have luxury tax issues. Basically, if they sign Snell or any other free agent at this point, He'll be paying more than double his salary because of the 110% tax. You've got the Giants. Yes, Alex Cobb is ahead of schedule. Their rotation is still down at least one starter until Cobb and then in the second half, Robbie Ray comes back. They need help. And though they would never be in the mix for Blake Snell, the Miami Marlins, how about their rotation, folks? They have lost, in addition to Sandy Alcantara, who is recovering from Tommy John surgery, They've lost Braxton Garrett, Edward Cabrera, and most recently, Yuri Perez. They're down to Jesus Lazardo, legitimate, solid mid-rotation pitcher, A.J. Puck, who is converting from the bullpen, and Trevor Rogers, who was out most of last season, and they'll have to patch together the rest. It's a mess in Miami. They certainly could use a Lorenzo or Clevenger, but do I expect them to actually spend money? No, I do not expect them to do that. So these teams need pitching. But here's the problem when it comes to Snell, and I touched on this in the windup today. The windup is the Athletics free daily baseball newsletter that I write every day of the week, during the week, during the season with Levi Weaver. And the problem is something that was summed up by a prominent starting pitcher I spoke with last week. Did not want to be renamed. He didn't want to be involved in this situation, but he made a great point. This is a guy who knows Blake Snell pretty well. And he said, Blake Snell like most of us, needs time to get acquainted, to get comfortable in new situations. 
That's understandable. We're all kind of like that, right? So it's not just that he might be physically behind. And his agent, Scott Boris, would suggest that he is not physically behind, that he's been training at one of Boris's institutes, that he is ready to go physically, and he has examples, Boris does, that he can share about pitchers who have done this, his clients who have done this, Kyle Loesch in 2013, Dallas Keuchel in 2019, Loesch signed at the end of spring, Keuchel in June, and both had really good seasons. So perhaps it's not a physical question whether he'll be ready to go, Blake Snell, and for that matter, Jordan Montgomery. But the way this pitcher described it, he said, listen, I know Blake, Blake's going to need time because it's not just the physical part of it. And think about it. The adjustment to a new team, and yes, he's going to a new team. He's not going back to the Padres and he's not going back to the Rays. The adjustment to a new team requires you to get acquainted and acclimated with a new catcher, a new pitching coach, a new manager, new teammates, a new home in a new city. It's a lot, folks. Now, maybe Blake Snell can handle it. Maybe Jordan Montgomery can handle it. All good. But again, we're asking a lot of these guys. And Snell is a guy who traditionally has not been the fastest of starters. Remember last year, he had that run from late May to the end of the season. That's what won the Cy Young Award. He was brilliant. But let's look at his career numbers before and after the All-Star break because they're telling. Before the All-Star break, Blake Snell, career ERA, 3.82. After the All-Star break, Blake Snell, career ERA, 2.46. Much better in the second half of the season. So if you're a team and you're considering Blake Snell, and I've touched on this before, and he wants an opt-out after one year, which most likely he does. He's 31. He is most likely going to want another crack at this. You're thinking, okay, this guy is not joining us until late in spring training if we sign him now. He might not get going right away. He's going to need time to get acclimated, as we just discussed. He is traditionally better in the second half than he is in the first and we're going to lose a draft pick that we can't recover because you can't make a guy a qualifying offer a second time if he signs right now. Wow, that's a lot. When you're paying him, in addition to all this, 25 to 30 million most likely per season. That is the price at least Blake Snell and Scott Boris would want for him going forward. Probably closer to 30 than 25. If it was 25, maybe the Astros would have this done by now. So... Again, you've got these examples Boris uses, Loesch and Keiko and guys who have succeeded in these circumstances. But it's still a relatively small sample size of pitchers who have done this. And we still have no clue, no idea really, how Blake Snell is going to handle it, how Jordan Montgomery is going to handle it. Maybe they'll be fine, as I said before. But maybe they won't be. So I ask again, it's March 18th. Do you know where your free agents are? Time now for the Inside Dish, the portion of the show where we talk about something I've written, an issue in the game, and this week, it's going to be kind of a combination of both. Something I've written and one of the hottest issues in spring training, one of the most fascinating questions of the upcoming season, and it regards the Dodgers' plan to use Mookie Betts at shortstop. This is going to happen, folks, and it's amazing that it's going to happen Considering the Dodgers signed nine free agents, made six trades, awarded two extensions, spent more than $1.25 billion on players this season in future commitments, and yet they still have a question at shortstop. And they have a question at shortstop, of course, because Gavin Lux, at the start of spring, demonstrated renewed throwing problems. He's had them before at short. So they determined that they wanted to move Mookie to short, but keep Gavin Lux in the mix, play him at second base. You might ask why the Dodgers are doing this. Why are they disrupting one of their franchise players, moving him to a more difficult position? He was supposed to be the second baseman to accommodate a guy that maybe shouldn't even be in the lineup at all. Well, part of the reason is the Dodgers really believe, as I wrote, that Gavin Lux can hit. They believe he is going to be an offensive force in the middle infield at some point, sometime soon. So they want to play him. He's been a top prospect. He's had the throwing issues, yes, but they believe that 
they will be somewhat alleviated at second base. It's not as difficult to throw. So that's part of it. The other part of this, and this is really a fascinating part, is that Mookie wants to do it. He wants to challenge. He's a gold glove right fielder. We know that. He is someone who can be more than capable at second base. We saw that last season. And he wants to prove to the Red Sox and to the world that the Red Sox should not have moved him off shortstop in whatever it was, 2012, 2013. He is eager for this. He relishes the challenge. Now, this is not necessarily settled. Remember Dave Roberts' famous line about this entire situation. It's permanent for now. It's one of my favorite phrases of the year. It might not be topped, by the way. Permanent for now. Now, if Lux's throwing problems become an issue at second, and we're going to find out real quick, season starts Wednesday for the Dodgers, if they're an issue, the Dodgers have a number of other ways they can go. The most obvious way is to put Miguel Rojas at short, but move Mookie back to second, which could have been the plan all along. Miguel Rojas was the primary shortstop for the Los Angeles Dodgers last year. They scored 900 runs. They had a pretty good season. But the Dodgers seem to believe that at 35, Rojas maybe can't handle that big a load. So that's one alternative. It's certainly a possibility. They also have others in the mix. Chris Taylor, probably better at second than he is at short. Kike Hernandez, not good at short last year for the Red Sox, but we now have learned that it might have been due to his injuries, his hernia situation, so he can go back to short too. So they have ways they can go. But again, Mookie is kind of the driving force here too because of his desire to do it. Now, as I wrote in my column on Friday, the danger is not that He's going to take his defense over to his offense. Look, he is great at compartmentalizing. No one with the Dodgers expects this to be a problem in that regard. The danger is also not that it's a greater risk of injury. Though shortstop clearly is a more physically demanding position than second base, it's not leaps and bounds more demanding. It's still a middle infield spot. And remember last year, Mookie Betts wanted to go to the infield because it reduced the wear and tear on his body. And he explained it to me one day. I thought it was amazing. He said, hey, when I run to the outfield, to right field from the dugout, how many steps is that? And when I run to second base, how many steps is that? Obviously, fewer steps. He was trying to make the point to this simple mind. And believe it or not, for a player, that is wear and tear. You do that nine times a game, 162 times a year. It's something that adds up. So Mookie is positive about this. He's a guy who wants to do it. And here's what he said when I asked him about it. When I asked about the doubts that some people have over how good he can be at second base. What Mookie Betts said was this. There's a lot of doubt out there, which is cool. That's what makes it fun. Someone's going to be right and we'll find out. So getting back to this, if the danger is not that he's going to take his defense into his offense. If the danger is not that he's going to be more physically exposed, then what is the problem? Well, the problem or the question is whether Mookie Betts will be good at shortstop. Might turn out that he's mediocre at best. He hasn't played this position with any regularity since the early 2010s. And even then with the Red Sox, he was playing other spots as well. He played as a kid, but he hasn't been a regular shortstop really forever. So it's certainly possible that he's not going to be a gold glove candidate. But Dodgers people seem to believe that he's going to get better. And if he's mediocre at the start, a fringe average in the scouting parlance, if he's fringe average at the start, maybe he's average two months in, and maybe by the end of the season he's above average. Seriously, this guy is one of the best athletes in the game. Would you put anything past him? I don't think we should. And here's another interesting element which I raised in the column, which I learned when I was out at Dodgers camp. About a week ago, Mookie Betts addressed the Dodgers minor leaguers. Now, they had Betts do this. They had Clayton Kershaw do this for the pitchers. And Mookie Betts basically told the minor leaguers, listen, guys, I might flop. I might not be good at this, but I'm willing to do it because it's best for the team. Again, a superstar in the middle of a $365 million contract switching positions, going to a more difficult position on the defensive spectrum because he believes it's best for the team. 
And think about the message this sent to the Dodgers minor leaguers. Here's a guy making himself vulnerable, willing to fail for the benefit of the team. That's a pretty powerful message that he is sending. And clearly, he wants to prove a point here. He wants to prove to the Red Sox people who moved him off shortstop all those years ago. He wants to prove that he can be only the second player in history to win a gold glove in both the infield and the outfield. Darren Erstad, the only other guy to do this, and his infield position was not in the middle. It was at first base. So Mookie Betts could make some history here. And what a thing this is. It'll be fascinating to watch no matter how it turns out one way or the other. And there are a lot of people who question this. A lot of people who say, what are the Dodgers doing? It's Mookie Betts. Leave him alone. I get that argument. But I do want to see how this works. Mookie sent a powerful message to the minor leaguers. He is an astonishing athlete. This is a compelling storyline, to say the least. Time now for Grilling Ken. Let's get to your questions. First question comes from Ms. Cards, who says simply, Ali Marmel extension? Well, this is a good question, and it's one a lot of Cardinals fans have. In reading Katie Wu's account on The Athletic, it was really interesting to see the comments. I can't recall seeing one positive comment about the two-year extension that Ali Marmel signed through 2026. And in fact, if we were talking a week ago about managers on the hot seat, he would have been pretty high on the list coming off the season that they had last year, one of the worst seasons in recent Cardinals history. Aaron Boone's on that list. Dave Roberts is on that list. There are others on that list. But Ali Marmel would have been on it. So what the Cardinals did was decide that they did not want him going into the season as a lame duck. They did not want that being a distraction. They believe in Ali Marmel, and they want him to be their guy. It's rather interesting because he has not proven that he is a winning major league manager. First year was pretty good. Second year, not so good. A lot of different issues came up. He's someone who has a lot of ability, no doubt. Smart guy, has leadership qualities. No one's questioning that. But a lot of smart guys with leadership qualities haven't succeeded as managers. So we don't know yet if Ali Marmo is going to succeed as a manager, but the Cardinals placed this bet and I wonder a little bit if they place this bet to quiet the noise that would have arisen if the Cardinals struggled and Yadier Molina was lurking and Albert Pujols, who wants to manage, was lurking. Uh, it could have been a little bit of an issue. So I was surprised to see this, yes. I'm not saying I hate it because I don't know what to think, honestly, of Ali Marmel just yet. But if this team struggles, the issue of his security is going to come up. Even though he's signed for two more years, Manager's salaries are basically utility infielder salaries, at least when you're at Marmel's experience level. If they need to make a move, they will make a move. But they don't want to make a move, and that's why they awarded him this extension. Next question. It comes from Nick. Nick asks, how does Toronto fill their third base gap? Well, it's a fair question, Nick, since they don't have Matt Chapman anymore. They lost him in free agency. Giants signed him. But the Blue Jays addressed this early in the offseason. They addressed it by signing Isaiah Kiner falefa He is going to be most likely their primary third baseman. They have other alternatives, Ernie Clement, David Schneider, Kevin Biggio. You can do some other things, but IKF is going to be the guy. And it's interesting. Robert Murray pointed this out last week in his notes column. He mentioned that IKF's deal, two years, 15 million, is one of the better ones for a player this offseason. Considering that a number of other infielders like Ahmed Rosario, Gio Urshela, were forced to sign much lesser contracts. Now you can argue IKF is better than those guys. He's got more versatility. But he did pretty well. And the Jays, like the Cardinals with Marmol, are placing a bet here. And we'll see how it turns out. All right, our final question comes from Sam. Sam asks, <laughs> where do you think J.D. Martinez ends up? Feels like nobody is heavily involved in his market right now. Well, it's hard to know what's going on in any player's market at any given time. We, as reporters, learn some things from time to time. We learn which teams are interested, as we did last Friday, the Athletic, with Houston and Blake Snell. But to know the entirety of it, you'd really have to be inside the agent's cell phone, and none of us are inside the agent's cell phone in any of these cases. 
J.D. Martinez, represented by Scott Boris. We have heard of interest this offseason. Interest from the Angels, interest from the Mets, interest from a variety of teams. There are a number of teams that still could use help at DH. And Brandon Belt from the left side is still out there as well. Brandon Belt had a pretty good year last year. But for me to guess where J.D. Martinez is going to end up at this point, I would be just talking off the top of my head, not with any real knowledge. I don't know. But as I said at the top of the show, March 18th, man, let's go. These guys have to get into camp somewhere. I'm not saying they should accept horrible deals, but at the same time, for the sake of their season, sake of their futures, it would behoove them to at least get into camps as soon as they possibly can with the season so close to starting. I want to thank everyone for their questions. Thank you for listening, for watching. By now, you know where to find us. YouTube, Apple, Spotify, like us, subscribe to us. And remember, we are coming back on Thursday. We're going to two shows a week, Thursday at 1230 Eastern, live. And as I said at the top of the show, we are going to have a co-host. Now, we have not talked about who that co-host is going to be yet. We have not revealed that person's identity. But that co-host will be participating in the Grilling Ken questions, in the Dude and Dork of the Week, which we are now running on Thursdays. And I bet we'll have some doozies this week, as we always do. But again, co-host is coming. His identity, her identity, whoever it might be, that will be revealed. Thursday, 1230 Eastern, live. If you're a new customer on the BetMGM app, you can download the app on iOS or Android or visit BetMGM.com to get the first bet $1,500 offer. Um, sign up and deposit at least 10 bucks into the new account, place your first wager, and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if the bet loses. And if that happens, those bonus bets will be available once your initial wager is settled. Now, if you're in the state of North Carolina, you've gotten all the attention lately because... But MGM is live there, and they have a special Bet5 Get150 that's still running at the moment. You will receive $150 instantly in bonus bets, regardless of the outcome of your wager, if you place a wager at standard odds price of at least $5. Got to be a first-time user down there in North Carolina, and it's the first week that they launch down there. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Hey, everybody. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content. Fair Territory airs each week, and we'd love for you to become a part of our community. Here's another video you might enjoy. See you next time.